Hello, I'm Ana Wiltos, and today I'm here to talk to you about someone who is possibly one of the most overrated military leaders in all of history. And of course, I am talking about none other than Hannibal Barca, uh, most famous for his leadership of the Carthaginians during the Second Punic War. And of course, this has been debated before. And I, let's let's take a quick look at the Historum forums on a perspective on the two different sides of the issue. Okay, so this is a snippet from Historum.com where there is a brief exchange between the user Sargon of Akkad and Divus Julius. So let's take a brief look at what they're saying. Of course, this is not the entire, uh, the entire debate. I will link it to you in the description. Of course, I don't have time to go over the whole thing. But this is a brief look at uh, both sides of the issue. I don't know if it's the best look at both sides of the issue, but we'll get to that later. Okay. Sargon of Akkad says, What you'll get now is the armchair generals and historians who will somehow think that their omniscient historical eye allows them room to say, if a man made any mistakes, then he was less than brilliant. They'll say that since this and that meant he was unable to fulfill his objective of destroying Rome utterly, that he was a failure and was never as good as his press made him out to be. Because they have the full stretch of history to compare his actions to and see the exact consequence of his decisions, they will be able to say, oh, well, he should have done X and assume that because he didn't do X, that he made a bad or wrong choice. Ignore those people. What happened is that the most fearsome militaristic society in the Western world has brought to its knees by the skill, courage, and genius of Hannibal for the 15 years they danced to the tune of a man who made his name echo across history throughout, through, not throughout, the sheer weight and gravitas of his actions. Hannibal was a military genius and his deeds were nothing short of legendary. Anything less, and he would have been crushed as easily as Rome crushed most of her competitors, and only the most ardent historian would have known of him. Okay, so I say fair enough, fair enough. He had, he definitely had some skill, especially on the battlefield, where I think tactically he definitely was superior to most of his opponents. However, he, that still doesn't change the fact that in the long term, he did not win. And of course, I'm a bit of a meritocrat, I have to say. And what we need is results. And we, say, we can say that Hannibal was a good military leader because of his skill, but I cannot say that he was one of the greatest because, of course, he did not deliver results. But uh, that's that's my son, and let's see what uh, Divus Julius says. Okay, he points up to Sargon of Akkad's post, and then he yawns. That's very nice and all, but we armchair generals and historians... Personally, I don't think the title is insulting in the slightest. I am proud to be such. Smiley face. Still have a fair old point to be made. Basil Little Hart was, I think, quite astute when he pointed out that in surveying the past people have a great tendency, especially when it comes to military history, to be drawn to the great failures finding the flash of a comet more enticing than the steady shining of a star. Hence names like Alexander, Hannibal, and Napoleon stand out so much, while names like Cyrus, Scipio, and Marlborough are less dug out. Arguably, arguably, even a Caesar might only owe his prominence in the history books to the assassin's daggers. 
Nelson to the shot of a sniper, Churchill to the abandonment by the voters. Rambling aside, our point is that we who argue against Hannibal maintain that he worked up a reputation disproportionate to his actual achievements, and that has carried down the ages. We do not deny that he was a genius, but we also argue that he was not a true genius in the sense that he was nearly as good as he is often made out to be. He made horrific blunders that cannot be excused merely by sniping that his detractors have the benefit of hindsight. Simply because Hannibal was not the greatest military commander of all time does not necessarily mean that he was the worst of all time, but nor is the reserve the bleh, but nor is the reverse true. Personally, I like to stand on the middle ground for this one. See my first post on this thread. So I have to say I, that is a very good retort, because of course. We're not denying that Hannibal was a good general. We're just saying that he did not achieve the greatness that puts him on the levels of maybe Alexander the Great or Julius Caesar in the sense of achievement. Because he is quite, quite honestly a victim of his times in that the way he waged war just was ineffective against his enemies. It may have been effective against some enemies, but certainly not the Romans. And as such, his achievements do not match the pomp that some have given him. Okay, so enough of that. You can check out the the rest of this exchange on historum.com. I will put the link in the description. Okay, but now... Let's actually take a look at what this, um, what I would call this overratedness is boiled down as. In the sense where I don't think Sargon of Akkad is actually overrating Hannibal. He's just, I, I just don't, I just don't rate him as high as Sargon of Akkad rates him. But let's actually take a look at some actual overrating. So let's move on to that right now. In order to examine this overratedness, I have decided to look at five different list articles. Of course, this is by no means an exhaustive list, and there's many other things out there, some of them more accurate than others. But let me start with, uh, with this one, which is from none other than historylists.org. Okay, the Carthaginian general is considered one of the most brilliant commanders in history. In 218 BC, he invaded Italy by crossing the Alps and inflicted several devastating defeats to the Roman army, most notably at Trebia, Trasimene, and Cannae. However, Roman attacks on Carthage forced him to return home where he was decisively defeated by the Roman general Scipio Africanus in 183 or 182 BC, he committed suicide to avoid falling into the Roman hands. And I say, fair enough. That's very good and, in fact, highly historically accurate. Now, what we also see here is that he defeated the Romans on at least three major battles. There's a, a few more minor engagements as well that he defeated the Romans, but that aren't generally that big in the historical record. And also we look at how it does accurately portray him as having lost the war. In fact, the same war that he won several battles in. So, you know, you win battles and you lose a war. But actually, on the list itself, it uh, it is not a numbered list. But judging by the order in which the um, it, the order in which the generals are, you have Alexander the Great put first, 
uh, then Julius Caesar, Sun Tzu, Cyrus the Great, Hammurabi, Ramses II, then Hannibal. And then Trajan and uh, Joshua from the Bible and Themistocles. I think it's actually a fair list. So this one passes on uh, overratedness. I think that certainly there could have been many other generals that could have filled out the, the list rather than Hannibal's rather than Hannibal because it's top 10 ancient military commanders. So I'm thinking there could have been many others to replace Hannibal on that list. And as such, I don't think he belongs on, on that list, which in my uh, opinion makes him overrated. But of course, that's just my opinion. Okay, let's move on to the next one then. Okay, the next one is from ancienthistory.about.com. Links are in the description below. Okay, Hannibal almost conquered Rome. Oh my goodness, I think we have an exaggeration here. Considered Rome's greatest enemy, Hannibal was the leader of the Carthaginian forces in the Second Punic War. His cinematic crossing of the Alps with elephants overshadows the 15 years he harassed Romans in their home country before finally succumbing to Scipio. Alright, here's a big problem here. Cinematic? Are you kidding me? How is that cinematic? Cinema wasn't even invented, and also we, we don't have that accurate descriptions of them going across the Alps. Also, it I definitely don't think it was cinematic when you have this river of poo coming down from uh, the people at the front of the army and then the people at the back of the army catch all kinds of diseases. And trust me, that was a serious problem with uh, <laughs> crossing the mountains and also all the elephants that died on the Alps. Now, I've been to the Alps, of course. I used to live around that area. And yeah, not the place you want to put elephants, which is why, which is why <laughs> his cinematic crossing of the Alps with elephants overshadows the 50 years he arrests Romans in their home country before finally succumbing to Scipio. His crossing of the Alps with elephants does not overshadow that because his crossing of the Alps with elephants was all in all a stupid idea let's be honest he got to circumvent some roman defenses that were more towards the coast but he could beat them in battle anyway so if he beat them in battle anyway he probably lost more soldiers crossing the alps than he would have actually lost if he engaged the romans on the coast I'm saying probably. I'm not saying that this is absolute. You know, Sargon of Akkad, you've got me on that one. I, I, I do not know how many soldiers he would have lost, but if his record on uh, Tazimene, Trebia, and Canae are to go on, he probably would have done better just going straight, and he also would have ended up with uh, most of his elephants alive rather than most of his elephants dead. So crossing the Alps was actually a very uh, damaging move for his army as such. I don't think it, def it overshadows the 15 years he harassed the Romans in their home country. I think that's definitely the high point of his campaign, being able to harass the Romans 15 years in their home country and also the downfall of his campaign in the sense that he actually went 15 years without actually making any gains. He he did not almost conquer Rome because he was actually unable to siege Rome. Um, well, he was unwilling to siege Rome, probably because he deemed himself to be unable to. And the reason I believe that he deemed himself to be unable to besiege Rome is because he had 15 years and he didn't do it. That, that speaks volumes. In, in other words, 
in those 15 years, he did not once see an opportunity to actually accomplish the goal of his campaign. And although his victories in the field may make him a good general, his, uh, his inability to actually accomplish his stated goals um, do not put him on a status of greatness equal to that of some of the other people on this list. So let's actually talk about what are some of the other people on this list. So it's not a numbered list, but assuming from the top and bottom positions, the top is Alexander the Great, the bottom is Trajan or Trajanus, I think that we can assume that the top is probably higher. Of course, not saying that it is. We'll just assume for a moment. Okay, Alexander the Great, uh, with the subtitle Conquered Most of the Known World, fair enough. Alaric the Visigoth sacked Rome, um, which actually puts him on an achievement level a bit above Hannibal, because he actually sacked Rome, and he also was uh, pretty powerful otherwise, but uh, also pretty weak in other ways. So there's a trade-off between them. Maybe they're at this. Maybe he's slightly below Hannibal in skill. I I think maybe. Um, Attila the Hun, of course, Cyrus the Great, then Hannibal, and Julius Caesar. So, assuming that this is numbered, which it isn't, if it were numbered, this would put Hannibal above Julius Caesar, as well as above Scipio Africanus, who's below there on the list, and uh, Sun Tzu, and uh, Gaius Marius, uh, who reformed the Roman army, then Trajan. Okay. So, these first two lists weren't numbered lists, so we can't say for sure if it was the author's intention to put Hannibal above a certain person or not. But the next three are numbered lists, so we will actually know what they intend to say here. Okay, so let's move on then. Okay, our third article comes from none other than InsiderMonkey.com. Okay, it reads, Although the Roman Empire brought most of its enemies to their knees, the Carthaginian general was not one of them. Hannibal Barca's military cunning allowed him to deal several blows to the Romans before he took his own life in order to avoid capture. Alright, the first sentence, and in fact the rest of it, the whole thing, leaves a bit too much to the imagination. Seriously, article writers, have you heard of the Battle of Zama? Have you heard of the outcome of the Second Punic War? Because Hannibal was defeated, all right? He wasn't captured, but he was definitely defeated. So, let's actually, let's actually look a bit further than this. You might say, well, maybe, maybe that doesn't count, okay? So, let's actually take a look at the Battle of Eurymedon, okay, from the Roman Seleucid War, in which Hannibal took part in. He was, I believe, the naval commander in that battle, and he was fighting against Rhodes, uh, the Rhodians, uh, a, a Greek city-state, and he lost, okay. Fair enough. Maybe, maybe that's just an outlier. Maybe Hannibal just was, that was a bad day. Zama was also a bad day. All right. Well, it, it, tough, tough to say. Okay, he won several battles in Italy, but when it came down to it, in the crucial moments, he did not pull through. And that is just, that's just something that historians have to live with, that Hannibal Barca just didn't make it in the end. He was a good general, uh, but in the end, he was just outclassed, it seems. And yeah, he did eventually kill himself rather than uh, actually surrender to the Romans in the end. 
Um, because I think at some point, um, some people were even debating of turning him over to the Romans, but uh, he definitely did not want to fall into the Romans' hands, so he killed himself. Okay, so let's actually move on to the next article now. Our next list comes from top10s.net with the article Top 10 Generals of Western History. Just to be specific, they're not talking about all of history, just so you know. Okay, it says, The most feared opponent Rome ever faces, faced, this Carthaginian general was raised to the task of defeating the Romans from early childhood by his father, Hasdrubal. Hannibal abandoned previous Carthaginian tactics of passive naval superiority and marched a force on elephants over the Italian Alps, defeating the Romans at nearly every battle he fought. He made a Roman general, Quintus Fabius Maximus, famous merely for being able to delay Hannibal's advance without enormous loss of life. Fabius was granted the title Cunctator, or Delayer, by the Roman Senate. At Cannae, Hannibal's forces cobbled together and, suffering from losses, routed an enormous Roman army, killing or capturing upwards of 50,000 enemies, eventually defeating, uh, uh, eventually defeated by Scipio Africanus and deserted by his government. He remained a scourge the Romans invoked to justify raising Carthage. All right. Let's take a closer look at this, okay? Most feared opponent Rome ever faced. Maybe. Um, I think Attila the Hun certainly g gives him a run for his money on this. Um, maybe anyone else that has actually invaded Rome itself gives him a, money, a run for his money on this. Um, okay, childhood Hasdrubal, that's fine. His father, Hasdrubal. That's good. That's very good. Oh, wait, no, wait. Wait a second. I think I just noticed something. Something that the article got wrong. Hasdrubal was not Hannibal's father. It was Hamilcar Barca. Um, Hamilcar, which means uh, brother of Melkart. Uh, Melkart being, I think, the patron god of Carthage. Um, Hasdrubal was, of course, another relative um, of Hannibal. Of course, these are all common, uh, common Carthaginian names. So there were multiple Hannibals, there were multiple Hamilcars, there were multiple Hasdrubals and multiple magos as well uh, in history, but we just know Hannibal Barca as the most uh, outstanding in our historiography. But this is definitely an egregious error. Um, instead of just misrepresenting a fact, this actually goes to the point of literally messing up. But maybe, maybe they were on an off day when they were doing their research. Okay, Hannibal abandoned previous Carthaginian tactics of of naval superiority and marched a force of elephants over the Italian Alps. Okay. Now, the reason they abandoned that tactic, I think, doesn't have so much to do with uh, them thinking marching elephants over the Alps was a superior tactic. Because, let's be honest, um, marching elephants over the Alps was extremely risky and I don't think it paid off as much as Hannibal would have liked it to pay off. Um, but the, by the time Hannibal came into power, uh, into political prominence, Rome had naval superiority. As, as such, attacking Rome navally was not a viable option in order to win a war with Rome, because Rome had a, a greater industrial backbone at this point, and also a, a larger navy. Okay, defeating the Romans at nearly every, every battle he fought. That's fair. That's fair enough. Hannibal was a great field general, and of course, 
his loss at Zama doesn't negate the fact that he won previously. Let me just be clear on that in case somebody was thinking I was saying that. Okay, Quintus Fabius Maximus famous merely for being able to delay Hannibal's advance without enormous loss of life. Fabius was granted the title Cunctator or Delayer by the Roman Senate. Okay, the Fabian strategy isn't the fact that he was delaying the Roman, not, not the Romans, delaying Hannibal in the sense, in the same sense that uh, Leonidas delayed the Persians, even though Leonidas definitely did not delay the Persians as much as the Greeks had intended to delay the Persians. But uh, Hannibal, Han the, uh, Fab Fabius's or Fabius's tactic or strategy, well, it's it's a strategy, not a tactic, was more based on denying Hannibal a decisive victory, which he succeeded in. And as the other article said, for many years, Hannibal remained in Italy and he was unable to win a battle decisive enough to change the outcome of a war. In the end, he lost the decisive battle. But uh, his victories were not decisive, and his loss was decisive. And, of course, I, I think it's also a huge gamble for the Carthaginians to have placed so much on the shoulders of one commander, who in the end ended up uh, wasting a lot of time in a war of attrition that he could not win, in the sense that he was getting enough supplies to to keep his army up, but he wasn't denying the Romans the ability to actually sustain themselves because they were in their own land, let's be honest. It's really easy to... It's much easier to sustain yourself if you're in your own land. Okay. And let's see if there's... Okay. Romans invoke to justify raising Carthage. Let me... Emphasize, I am saying Carthage, not Carthage, uh, in case uh, anybody has unclear audio. I am not adding an R in there, just just to be sure, because some people add an R in there, and I, I do not like that. But uh, this Carthage was actually raised many years after Hannibal had died. In fact, uh, I think, was it about 20 years um, I'm just looking this up right now. Yeah, about 20 years. Not exactly 20, but around there. Around around that uh, ballpark. So, I don't really think that the justification was that. It, it was more of that destroying Carthage was highly symbolic in the sense that they were gone. They were one of Rome's big enemies for a long time, and now they were gone. Um, but of course, later on, it was rebuilt, and it became very large in supplying Rome with grain. Okay, so enough on that. Let's actually take a look at the list itself. Um, this isn't on screen, but the list is a numbered list. So number one is Napoleon. Number two, Hannibal. Number three, Saladin. Number four, Robert E. Lee. Wow. Number five, Washington. George Washington, that is. Number six, Julius Caesar. Number seven, Joan of Arc. Number eight, George Patton. Number nine, Frederick the Great. Number ten, Attila the Hun. Why is George Washington a five on this list? Uh, I think he's much better as a political leader than a military leader. Let's just be honest on that. He, His military record is more of a win-lose-win-lose -lose rather than a win-win-win uh, like some people are. But uh, politically, I think he was pretty good. Um, but putting Hannibal above Julius Caesar, I think that's a bit too much for him. And also putting him above Frederick the Great and Attila the Hun might... Well, Frederick the Great, maybe. But I think Frederick the Great is pretty good. 
And uh, Attila the Hun, man, that guy was tough. But uh, he eventually didn't make it through. But at least him losing at the decisive battle did not wreck his country. Like Hannibal losing at a decisive battle wrecked his country. Um, on the other hand, actually it says that Frederick the Great's army was... Well, that his kingdom was pseudo-German, which it wasn't because Ostsiedlung, Prussia, was German, let's be honest. Um, by that time, it had definitely become majorly German. Okay, so that's a little bit off topic. Off topic? What's a topic? Off topic. Okay, let's move on before we drag our feet too much. Okay, our next article comes from ancienthistorylists.com. It says, Hannibal was perhaps one of the audacious military commanders with the affluent military tactics and strategy. The young eight years boy was raised loath towards Rome by his father, Hamilcar, who fought Rome in the First Punic War. His ingenious military tactics, imperial risk-taking behavior, makes him applauded by many historians. Who wrote this? Hannibal was mostly known for his courageous attempt to cross mountain Alp Alps with his 50,000 infantry, 9,000 cavalry, and 37 elephants, which was practically thought impossible at the time. The never-ending conflict between Rome and Carthage result Second Punic War, where Hannibal shows his brilliant military tactics despite all of his effort and greatest military strategy. His life mission to conquer Rome came to an end. He committed suicide to avoid falling into the Roman hands. Who wrote this? And let, let's 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 not even ask that. Who edited this? Somebody must have read this before this went up. Somebody should have at least spell checked, or at least made sure that there weren't any missing words. But my goodness, there has definitely been a problem with this. Ancienthistorylists.com, you have by far let us down. Okay, um, makes him applauded by many historians. Okay, apparently historians from the distant future have caused Hannibal Barca to applaud. Okay, um, crossing the Alps, of course, although it is an achievement, it's not as positive because it's also a loss at the same time. Um, Never-ending conflict between Rome and Carthaginians result in Second Punic War. It's not a never-ending conflict if it ends at from time to time. For example, there are periods of peace. You know that, right? Um, military brilliant, uh, brilliant military tactics. Fair enough, but not strategies, if you know what I mean. Uh, despite his effort and greatest military strategy, his life mission to conquer Rome came to an end. And again, this leaves a little bit to the imagination because it says he committed suicide to avoid falling into Roman hands after saying that his mission to conquer Rome, Rome came to an end. This, this, this doesn't imply, but some people might think that it implies that Hannibal actually committed suicide during his campaign in Italy, which he didn't. He committed it years later, somewhere far away from Italy. Okay, so let's actually take a look at the grander scope of this list. You won't see this on camera because, you know, not trying to use too much of derivative content, okay? Uh, number one is, of course, Alexander the Great, Fair enough. I, I can dig that, putting him on number one. I certainly say that's fair enough. Number two, Hannibal Barca, definitely overrated if you compare to the rest of the list. Cyrus the Great, greater than Hannibal Barca, that's for sure. Julius Caesar, I think he's greater. Sun Tzu, um, 
not entirely famous as a massively great field commander, but uh, he definitely did have some knowledge. Trajan, fair enough. Uh, Kali, well, not fair enough to be put below um, Hamilcar Barca, because it, what it all boils down to is when Hannibal Barca got his power to Hannibal Barca losing his power, was Carthage greater or was it weaker? That's what it boils down to. And I think that maybe almost all historians would agree that Carthage was definitely weaker after Hannibal Barca. Khalid bin Walid, fair enough, great guy to put on a list of uh, 10 greatest uh, ancient military commanders. That's great. Ramses II, good. Hammurabi, sure, fine. Let's put him on there. Leonidas, uh, no. I just have to say this. Leonidas does not deserve to be on this list. Put someone else in. Put Tamerlane in or something. Uh, let's see. This is actually a 12-point list, so Chandragupta Maria is... Chandragupta Maria is below that. And Tiglov Pilisar III. How is Mariah below Leonidas? Okay. Because let's let's be honest, Leonidas did not have the achievements that are comparable to many of the other people on this list. And also, he didn't even complete his actual goal uh, in the amount of time that he delayed the Persians. It was, in fact, significantly less than the Greeks had intended to delay the Persians. As such, I don't really put that up there. Tiglov Pilisar III, I think, fair enough. Assyrians, can't go wrong with one of the great Assyrians. So, I think that's all for now. But actually, let's, let's take a look at some democracy, okay? Let's take a look at how some... Uh, non-professionals have decided to rate Hannibal and we'll be looking at that right now okay here we have a an outcut from a list on the top tens.com top military generals and here we go number 91 Hannibal number 89 George Armstrong Custer Hannibal, two spots below Custer. Hmm. Yeah. That That is pretty harsh blow. But let, let's actually take a look at this. Um, it says Custer's command during the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, so great command there. And he, he rose quickly for the ranks. And apparently during the American Civil War... He was pretty good. As good as horse maneuvers Genghis Khan. I think that's an exaggeration. But uh, eventually, as some may know, he was eventually beaten by um, some of the Amerindians in the West after the Civil War. American Civil War, that is. And Hannibal, again, he had a bunch of victories early on in, in the war. And eventually, at the end, he was beaten. So, I think that's an interesting parallel there. You know, two generals that were pretty good and could have been much greater if it had just been for just one more victory in one decisive battle. Well, not necessarily, because, uh, of course, Fabian strategy, the Romans had more soldiers besides the ones that Scipio had, so even if Hannibal would have beaten Scipio, that still probably would not have been a victory in the war overall. And Custer, maybe, yeah, that would have been a victory, probably. I think the Amerindians that he was fighting really invested 
a lot into the fight, uh, more than the Romans invested at Zama, proportionally, that is. Okay, so I think that's enough on this topic. And if you like this video, then please give it a like. If you have anything to add or any corrections to make or any suggestions for future videos, please do leave a comment. Subscribe if you would like to see more of my content. You can also follow me on Twitter and on Google Plus if you really want to. Um, and also, if you want to support me, you can donate on Patreon. That's that's where links are in the description below. If you want to see any of the uh, articles that I have mentioned, links are also in the description below for you to check those out. So please do. Um, and I suppose I think that's all I've got to say. Uh, thank you all for watching, and I will be seeing you all next time on a over and out.